Welcome to Change the World Church. Um, leading preacher here at Change the World Church, Dr. Douglas Duncan. Let's pray. All right, thank you, Father God. I love you, Lord. You're King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You are anointed King. You're a promised King. You are the ultimate forever King. In the line of David is promised to fulfill Scripture. Perfect. Perfect in every way, all powerful in God. And you came to us, loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's February 5th, 2023. Welcome. Title of today's sermon. Well, let's read scripture. Matthew 26. When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples. You remember recap from last week. Remember what last week was about, you guys? The time is now. Yeah, the time is now. Exactly. Like glorious return. The the times of the uh in Matthew 24. Perilous times. 25, the parable of the ten virgins, where it was like, okay, let's be prepared. All the time, on, all the time. Time is now. Parable of talents. Yet maximize your resources, everything now. And the judgment, remember, he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. So, do every do be about the, God's business now. So, maximizing, doing poor, uh, God's work, um, giving all, doing all, just full on for Christ all the time, and the time is now. Um, so he just finished those words. So, when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming. So he'd been teaching, right? Leaving the temple. Remember, he left the temple. He, he talked about the temple being, he would die, uh, everything would be destroyed in three days and came again. So he'd been teaching uh, and on the Mount of Olives, talking to him up in the Mount of Olives. When Jesus finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. So right there, Jesus literally laid it out. In two days the Passover is coming, which the Passover came every year. But he says, in two days, the pastor was coming, and the Son of Man will be handed over for crucifixion. So, Jesus laid it out clearly. He knew it was coming. He was in control. God was in control. He's God. He's God's Son. He was in total, omnipotent control of everything. Fulfilling Scripture, getting everything happening so that we could repent of our sins, receive Him, and have that perfect will of Christ and live for him because he loved us deeply and dearly, fulfilled scripture, wanted to fill us and allow us to max out on him and do all those things he had planned and is, is his perfect plan. So despite sin and wickedness and the rebellion of people and entities and sinful nature, he gave us a chance to blot out those sins and be purified in him and be perfect in him and, and be in him. And he knew he was going to be betrayed by all and crucified and, and laid it all out right there. Title of today's sermon, Matthew 26. Christ, Passover lamb, dash anointed king of kings, Comma, betrayed by all. Christ, Passover Lamb, dash anointed King of Kings, comma, betrayed by all. You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together. So meanwhile, he's telling his disciples this. Meanwhile, the chief priests and elders of the people 
were gathered together in the court of the high priest and Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. So they were so wicked, purely bent on one of the common sins. It's wealth, pride, power, flesh. So they were so bent on these common sins and not with a repentant heart or open to the spirit or open eyes. What happened to the spirit with Saul? King Saul. Yeah, the spirit left him. So the spirit was not with these guys. And the spirit was around since Old Testament, New Testament. The spirit's been here. So Christ has been here since the beginning of time. Um, so they were not able to see, and in their wickedness and sinful nature, they were planning to kill. They, why couldn't they kill him during the day or, or take him during the day? They were afraid of riot because... They could they, they they could tell he was from God. He was performing miracles. He was um, blind seeing, people healed, Lazarus raised from the dead, um, others raised from the dead, uh, demons being driven out. I mean, his wisdom and and perfect nature, clearly he was from God. And the people knew um, that at some point Messiah was coming, and he had come in riding on a donkey, fulfilled that scripture with the palms and, you know, um, Hosanna in the highest, right? And they could not, they were having to do things and sneak around at dark and stealthy at night in order to try to get their agenda accomplished. Just shows how wicked they were. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. The disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it in preparation for my burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. And is it spoken of? It's, it's always spoken of what she did. So um, how much we know that the uh, price of the um, perfume was worth a year's wages, essentially. So it was, it's the, the, the concentrate could be mixed with um, other things. Uh, you know, like today it'd be like isopropyl alcohol or Olive oil, you know, they could mix it with other things and, and expand because the scent was strong. So that little bit was um, that powerful and worth that much money. And so, what did he? Uh, what was? What did Jesus say she was doing? So, so that's the theme today: is he's preparing for burial and to be the perfect sacrifice. Everyone will betray him, and it fulfill scripture and it's just he now he's getting his mind set and prepared for the ultimate sacrifice which which will pay for all the sins so that's kind of the gravity of today's sermon now do you guys um do you guys know the uh Which, um, so what do you use? Well, we'll go with that. I'm going to go with that in a minute. We'll get there. Okay. Then one of the 12 named, well, the, then one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? 
and they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. And from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, had Satan entered in at that time? Not according to scripture, but so this is something consciously he's making on his own accord. Now, Satan, obviously, if he wasn't going for Christ, then he'd obviously opened himself up. And, but he made that decision. Now, the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Okay, so let's go back and talk about the Passover and talk about all the scripture that's being fulfilled here, here and all the things that are going on. Um, so let's go back regarding the Passover and the time of the Passover to Exodus 12, verses 1 through 35. Say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, 
It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. There was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and all the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord, as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people and sent them out of the land with haste. For they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls, being bound up in their cloak on their shoulders, the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and jewelry and for clothing. So um, what time, uh, or what is going on at this time in, the, in Exodus? What, what time is this passage? It's the last plague on Egypt. Yeah. It's literally the passage about the last plague in Egypt. What parallels can you draw from that passage to Christ and the Passover upcoming in two days in the in Scripture? Christ was the unblemished lamb. Is a perfect, perfect unblemished lamb. Let's just take each point. And we'll we'll recapitulate. He was a perfect unblemished lamb. Brought in, even brought in through the sheep gate. They believe, you know. Um, Potentially, but yeah, the perfect sacrificial lamb and that lamb was sent to spare the firstborn son, which he ended up being spared as the firstborn son of God. Um, and the blood of that lamb was to atone and protect them like Jesus atoned for their sins and sacrifices, blood sacrifices also were for atoning sins. Hyssop. Excellent. Well, and we'll have more about that coming up in another sermon. I appreciate you bringing that up. Also utilized, um, we'll talk more about it, but healing arts and things like that. Um, how, how many uh, bones did you disarticulate or break in the lamb? Or how many bones did you break in the lamb uh, for Passover, preparing the, the lamb for Passover? Notice it specifically said you don't break any bones. So that fulfilled scripture later when Christ didn't have any bones broken. Um, yeah, he roasted it whole by fire. Um, what um, What is the significance of the unleavened bread? On multiple levels, I guess. Or whatever you say. We'll start with whatever. Yeah, first thing, um, they had, what, what is leaven? I mean, in, in real, real, in real life. It's the kind of fungus that's called yeast. Yeah, so what does yeast do? Is it, um, if it's on one edge of the, uh, like a starter um, piece, like a starter piece of dough, and you combine it with the other dough, how does it work? Yeah, so it'll go through the whole, it'll work its way through the whole loaf because it's, it's, it's yeast, it's alive. And so it works its way through the whole, whole dough and then through the carbon dioxide fermentation, what does that do when it releases CO2? When it, yeah, it makes it rise. So um, how, how long does that take? Five minutes? Yeah, so that, that usually they start it overnight, and then they're ready in the morning to bake the bread, or maybe they bake the bread and, and 
you know, early morning when the fire is hot, you know, from keeping them warm at night. So, but the, they started, and so they had the dough, the, the starter dough, but it wasn't leavened yet because it hadn't been combined with the starter dough. It was just plain dough. They hadn't put it together with the process. And so how did they carry it? They just put it in their what? They found it up in their kneading bowls. Yeah. Clothes. Yeah. Put in their kneading bowls, which they bound in their cloaks, and they were ready to roll. I was thinking about all the logistics that uh, we go through when we move, and what mom and Rachel and everyone just, like, puts together, you know, and organizes. And I was just thinking about how those ladies were organizing and getting all their things ready to go, you know, so they could prepare for their families and everything. So that was pretty amazing. So what does leaven represent spiritually sometimes? Sin. Yeah. So sin. So they were, um, one, they were supposed to recognize the immediacy and the miracle of having to be on the move. Um, and, and, and the miracle God was doing and he was liberating them and freeing them. When they're liberated and free, they can't be bound up. They got to be ready to mobilize. And then leaven also in some parables or sayings or teachings represents sin and, you know, leavening the dough. It's not always sin, but um, it can be. So they weren't supposed to eat leaven all week or else they'd be cut off from the tribe. So that's the Passover. So Jesus is celebrating the Passover and they're looking to arrest him at that time as a perfect Passover lamb. And of course, there was animal sacrifices were the way of atoning for sins at this time. Yeah. All right, let's read 1 Corinthians 5, 3 through 13. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boat, oh wait, oh yeah, for sure. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old heaven, the leaven of, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom, are, whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So what's that passage covering or saying? So. That's, I mean, for anyone, you can ask yeah. Yeah. Showing leaven as like sin, and you have to just get rid of all those sinful people like leaven. And it also says Christ is yeah, perfect. So, um, leaven, um, he's using leaven here as a sin that's, that's, because if you, what happens, now is he talking about all the people in the world or specifically brothers and sisters in Christ? Specifically. Yeah, so specifically our brothers and sisters in Christ. So what happens, you know, come, everyone comes, right? Everyone, we want everyone to repent. So they come and they have come to the church and they've had either enough time or let's say they've repented, you know, in Christ and joined the church. They're now counting themselves as a brother or sister in church. How do you have to behave? What happens when you commit, when you commit to Christ in a body of believers? Of course, you want to go on and be baptized because your body's, you're burning to obey Christ. It's obviously a, such a gravity, uh, um, representation and holy sanctified act of obedience before God commanded 
I want to, I want to be baptized and buried in that water like Christ was and raised up again like Christ when he was resurrected. I'm a, I'm a Christian now. I'm a born again Christian. I'm a ba- I've been baptized and raised up to show I'm, I'm in. You know, like the baby's born out of the water in the womb and your rebirth. You're not coming, you're coming out of the water again, but as a new creation in Christ. That's what that represents, like birth coming into the world. You're being born, resurrected out of that grave, dead and born. That's such a powerful, solemn ceremony. You're joyous, but solemn. You know, yes, as joyous as a wedding, but as solemn as being knighted. The, the most, or whatever is the most gravid thing you can think of, you know, in terms of seriousness. Um, maybe be the husband and wife together, kneeling before each other and pledging themselves to each other before the wedding or something, you know, like coming to that grip, you know, but, but to God, I mean, even more serious, right? Um, So your brother in Christ and you're sinning, what's going to happen? What does yeast do in the dough? And what's that sinful brother in your church going to do? The yeast is spreading all over the dough. So if you see one person who's like messing around, it's just going to sort of spread like an infection. So what do you do with that infection? You got to get it out. You got to get it out. Yeah, you got to cure it. You got to excise it, surgically excise it. And Passover lamb, right? The blood of Christ. The pass, he's a perfect Passover lamb. It says right there. So they're talking about the Lord's Supper in this passage, right? And how you behave and how, how grave you take the Lord's Supper representing how you treat that event. That's the... First uh, Peter um, chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in ignorance. But, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in also in all your behavior. Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. So what's the gravity of that passage? the immediate relevance and then the broader relevance to what's at hand. And you can go back last week and this week's sermon. Well, first of all, it's calling for us to be holy. Yeah. So it's calling for us to be holy right now. The time is now. And it's calling for us to be holy. And that's that's the gravity of the situation. What what is that gravity likened to in that passage that we've been talking about? Yeah, that's the that puts that puts the teeth into the gravity. If you don't behave just like your passage, right? Weed them out. The grass is gonna fade, and you're out. And why? What? 
it's um what's the and the theme is right now well christ died for us he was the precious lamb he's the precious lamb blood. so christ died for us he's a precious lamb we were dead in the grave we were dead to sin and committed to hell in our sinful nature he died as a perfect sacrificial lamb and then that perfect sacrificial lamb we have ex been repented we repented of our sins, received Christ, and resurrected in life like he was resurrected. So that's the gravity of the situation, what Christ sacrificed that we've accepted. So therefore, how do you live right now all the time? Are you a work in progress or do you go for it? You're, are you living holy and going for God with that full gravity of that in mind? So all both these talked about um, handing people over or being purified or a penalty. What in your passage, you remember why they handed them over? What was the hope in the in the in what the trials would and this also, both passages, what do we hope is the productivity or result of the trial? Uh, he'll be saved even though his flesh is destroyed. Yeah. So he's gonna get like disease, S T D, gonorrhea, syphilis, imbalance, uh, AIDS, uh, monkey pox. Uh, whatever you know um, is going on there you know and they need their flesh is going to get destroyed the syphilis you know it, it eats eats you up and you get a treponeme and it enters your brain and then you lose your balance and then um, you get this big bullseye lesion um, um, in a place I won't talk about in the sermon it's a kind of a synchronon and it, it, it destroys you you know, um, people get their flesh destroyed, but we pray that his soul would be saved. So we just, let's just stay holy. So that whatever trials we're going through, it's to either glorify God and what he went through for us, or we're growing and redirecting us or preparing us for better management and managing more resources for him. And just, we don't want it to be just to have to stay clean and get destroyed so that you can get saved and go to heaven. That, I mean, we want to be productive now, holy now. And not go through all that heartache just, just to get our, our weak mind squeezed back into holiness, right? So day of the Passover. This year. April 5th through the 13th, yeah, April 9th, yeah. April 5th through the 19th this year is a Jewish Passover. Easter's April 9th. I believe so. Um, okay, John 3, 15 through 16. So what? what's the point of this whole sacrifice? You know. So with the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The love of the Father that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And in that Passover, um, we'll go next to Isaiah 53, but let me save that for a minute. So we're, talk we're going to go over uh, a lot of the prophecies today that led to uh, in the crucifixion and the servant. When you love the Lord and you're a new creation in Christ, there's a way you're going to act. You know, like here, here is a young lady preparing herself more beautiful than the most beautiful wedding or presidential meeting I could ever imagine and more gorgeous. Yet it's for the Lord. She's preparing herself 
for the Lord and, and honoring him and with her giving her best, taking what God's given her and maxing out for the Lord. And you see the light, the way the light hits and God has made her um, just such a beautiful, wonderful creation to serve him. And, and she's full in him and purpose. And connected to her parents, we were bragging about her yesterday and with the, our ministry and patients were talking about her and, and she was showing deep affection for us in Christ and we were doing the same. And that's just the way a godly family works in union, a, a godly body. So the, the anointment, so how did some of the disciples react to this? It says many of them reacted, but we know for sure. Maybe, maybe all of them, but we know for sure one, right? Who was a who was really upset? Because he wanted he'd been known to be pilfering from the. Can you imagine pilfering from from God straight there? And Jesus said, "Now, even when you do that, now stealing any stealing is right in front of God, right anywhere." And here he is with Christ stealing out of the basket, you know? So what act did, did she do to honor the Lord? Preparing him for burial. So what, um, what do you do? Uh, what, what is it? What do you do for burial? Who wants a bonus first? You do? Okay. Early bird gets the worm. All right. Mom, John, uh, chapter 19, verses 39 through 40. Quick, can anybody name a couple of things you use for burial? Myrrh and aloe. Myrrh and aloe. I believe Frank, Frank's this is a great answer because that's very much talked about with burial and death and preparation. Um, very much so, and brought to him, to him. But the scripture, I, I believe you're correct. But we know for sure. Okay, thirty-nine and forty. I, I agree. I think. Okay. Okay, sorry. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Mountain team is excellent celebrating. Um, can we read that again, babe? Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. So 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes. 100 pounds. A hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes. So it kind of made, so if you took all this, you know, with the nard and, and which is kind of a fatty background and um, mixed it with uh, spices, aloe, you, you know, an aloe, picture an aloe plant. So that's another way you can stretch. So the aloe plant and you take um, planty and you could make, um, you could weave, you know, like plaster of Paris. You could take cloth and aloe and spices and make almost like a plaster of Paris. We ever had a fracture? Um, they use fiberglass a lot now, but if your surgeons ever use um, plaster on you, you know, we've practiced that some growing up. And or you make a statue or a molding and it gets hard. So you can make a, a, an encased hard structure with obviously, you know, the fragrant, right? To honor, honor that. These are some of the, just a photo showing um, just all the events that went on, even that, even that week, you know, leading up to Christ, uh, crucifixion. And even to the point where Christ said it was going to happen, and then after it happened, they were so concerned about the resurrection, the, the, they asked them to please make the most secure guard possible to prevent any question then the angel came, Christ appeared, and then the guards reported the stone being rolled away and Christ resurrected and the angel coming, and they paid them a heavy sum of money to try to bury it. So all this is exposed. 
so obvious and so clear. And then all the events that God did, and even the things that happened during the crucifixion, you know, from the darkness to the veil being torn from top to bottom, the thick veil, people coming back from the dead and walking around testifying. Earthquake that shook everything. So where were they? Now when Jesus was in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper. So how cool is that? He was in Bethany and hanging out with Simon the leper. So somebody that had been healed opened his house. Think about it. leprosy. Back then they didn't have an antibiotic cure. Um, so they... Um, if you're a leper, you were unclean and you were not allowed to worship. You were considered being, your skin was being destroyed because you lost your feeling and you get infected or you would cut and not be able to tell. Um, they're, it, you know, it was awful looking. Um, so you would, uh, leprosy, they had whole leprosy columns uh, or just, you know, colonies where people would go. Um, so this man who had no hope of being, they thought from sin and was being ostracized, flesh destroyed, just like our, our flesh is destroyed in sin. We are separated from God in the temple when we're sinning, just like we can be saved and restored and made whole. He made this man whole. So he's in his home. Don't miss that. He's in his home enjoying that hospitality when this happens. So Bethany is on the downside of this mountain. You work your way from Bethany up to Bethphage. We have significant events we talk about there, obviously. Then you go up to the Garden of Gethsemane, cross the Kidron Valley into the temple. So that's, that's where he is right now. So pretty amazing. So here's a kind of, you know, part of Jerusalem here with the Kidron Valley. There's a central valley. ben Hinnom or the Hinnaman Valley is equivalent to Hades or hell. Everything flows downhill and then they burn down here. So it's like, so just to show some other perspectives of that, this is coming down the hill and going up. There's a, a western hill. This is an eastern hill. And then the Mount of Olives is over here. So Mount Moriah there. Again, Mount of Olives, eastern hill. So here's my, uh, here's our other son, and just God made him talented, and so much talent, and so handsome, uh, so much uh, that he's doing, and, and he's just, um, he's given his heart and soul and mind to Christ, and just going all out. Here he is practicing for the worship. So here's, I wanted to show the burial shroud. So imagine you're encased in a hundred pounds of aloe, and myrrh, and spices, and anointed and you know probably rub flowers and rose petals in you know you can imagine Christ um, I mean like a cast tomb you know truly I say wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her then one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. And then going back to verse 3, The chief priests and elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur during the people. So with that in mind, let's uh, read Isaiah 53. And I want you to listen to this and think about what Christ went through. The title, today's sermon, Christ the Passover Lamb, anointed King of Kings, betrayed by all. Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, 
and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. And there's some translation in there to work through, but um, not covering all that in depth today. What are uh, what are the, some of the shri- direct analogies we see with, with Christ in that passage that you can just readily identify? Just pierced for our transgressions. Pierced. Mm-hmm. So he was, let's just take them, each one, pierced on the cross for our transgressions. Mm-hmm. He was silent before his accusers. He was silent before his accusers. Both Caiaphas and Pilate, they just heat on false testimony and abuse and mayhem. And we can see that readily today, not only um, and just everywhere in the world, everywhere, there's just constant false misinformation uh, out of wickedness and jealousy and um, seemingly no ethical rules, except there, there is a rule, right? It's Christ and God. But that, that's, we see that red handily and Christ endured that for, uh, for us and fulfilled scripture in doing so. He says grave for the wicked and the rich man in his death, so the rich man goes to the and be a paid for his grave. Yeah, so he was a rich man and uh, had a rich man's cave. Who, who gets their own fresh carved tomb carved out of a rock with a rock rolled in it like a sepulcher, you know? Um, and then with the wicked was the, so he was sacrificed with, robbers, wicked guys up to the left and the right and dragged off with them. You know, like like that. And just the countless times that says he took all of our turns. He took all of our sins. Mm-hmm. Amen. Oh, and divide the spoil like the guards cast lots for us. Yeah, the, the cast lots. He was also pierced with a spear. Oh, yeah. And just treated, oh, the sheep were scattered. That was the other big one that we're going to see. So we're going to see that fulfilled today. Sheep scattered, just everyone betrayed, everyone scattered. Complete betrayal and scattering from all his. Uh, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. 
Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and not despised and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me. As a ravening and a roaring lion, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. <clears throat> but you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth's line, lion's mouth. From the horns of the wild oxen you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive, posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. Amen. How many analogies to Christ can you find in there? You can just start and poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Yeah, so when you go through crucifixion, the pull dislocates your joints, and it's part of the way they can kind of speed along the process. God made a Christ-like dependent on his mother as he was growing up. Yeah, came from a woman. That's another scripture fulfilled in another testament, and that's, and he fulfilled that. Cast lots for his... He cast lots for his clothing. That's, that happened. Dividing one part and then casting lots for another part is really rare. So, like, that the odds of that being fulfilled in a person are really, like, minimal. Amen. Like, you either divide them or you cast lots for them. You don't do both. Yeah. But that happens, so. Yeah. Um, also, saying, God save you, you know, taunting him. Hey, if you're God's son, then call for him to save you. So, they talk about the taunting there. A lion, which rep Rome is often represented by the lion. Strong bulls of Bashan is just a reference to very strong people, soldiers, wicked people. They use that often. King David uses that, and it was also happening with Christ right here. How thirsty he was dried up like a posture. The extreme thirst was when you get beaten within one inch of death and then crucified, the bleeding out, there's different levels you'll see uh, 
of um, loss of blood, basically. You know, so as you as you hit different stages of shock, there's you know seventy five percent, you know, forty on down. And so as you do that, you can replace sometimes with water. Then you need blood. But the extreme thirst that happens is is beyond belief. And so um, he was he was in that phase. You know, just tongue sticking to mouth, thirsty, strength on bones exposed. Dogs have surrounded me. A band yeah. of evildoers has encompassed me. Yeah, dogs surrounded evildoers. And just to be abused. All right, let's pray and we'll do good tonight. All right, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your sacrifice and fulfillment of scripture of being God and all that you did for us so we could be saved and be full in you. Just in your prayer. Amen. So keep that in mind, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, and um, just the reverence and gravity of the Passover lamb and sacrifice and the betrayal. First Peter 2, um, verses 21 to 25. And then that sum it up. He suffered, so when you suffer, remember he suffered for you when you're suffering for righteousness. Um, and also he bore your sins. And the holy example um, that we should that we should follow. Um, everything parallels. Any other comments on that on the parallel on the scripture? Testament songs, which is like 100% parallels. You were scattered like sheep, but yet now you need to return to the shepherd because of his sacrifice, blood sacrifice. So stay holy and follow him, and he atoned for your sins. Amos 8 9. Yes. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Wow. When Christ was on the cross. How about that? And we're going to go through um, 40 to 50 of these later in the week. Psalm 34, 19 through 22. Yes. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So if you take refuge in him, you won't be condemned. And what's what's the other big parallel to the Passover lamb that we see there? He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. And did they fracture any of his? Usually they go through and break the tibia or the hip. Why? Can't push yourself you can't push yourself up to breathe. And also, how much blood volume can you lose to a femur fracture? 750 cc's. So it's almost a fifth of your blood volume you can lose just from a femur fracture quickly. You know, I mean, the compartments start to contain it at, at some point, but not before the day, uh, all the loss. If you hit an artery, it could be more, right? If you sever. Okay, 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through 17. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
I took you from the pasture, from the following of the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed the judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, moreover the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. So in both these, the enemies are vanquished. So Christ had enemies. Uh, talked about in the last scripture um, mom read and also in Andrew versus with David uh, the enemies are crushed the righteous will be lifted up so that's that's consistent who um, who did the spirit depart from again um, so who how is this scripture fulfilled regarding you'll have um, peace in the land I'll give you a direct sign um, he'll build me a house, and I'll correct him with a rod. How was that? A, where was that immediate? Solomon, King Solomon. Any enemies invading during the time of Solomon? Very good. He had peace. He even had up north, um, where the uh, valley, the uh, route by the sea, he controlled that. People paid tolls coming down from Egypt up, and he had uh, the largest kingdom established um, that they had seen. And they built the house, the temple, you know. Um, how was it fulfilled in your kingdom will be forever? Christ. That was Christ. Amen. So he fulfilled that scripture in Christ. And he was king of kings forever, right? And is. Isaiah 9, 7. Mm-hmm. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What do you think? Kingdom will be forever and justice and righteousness. Okay. <laughs> Straight from Isaiah and also replicating the scripture we just read from Second Samuel. How amazing is that? Psalm 45, 6 through 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. So he was anointed king of kings for his forever throne. When was he anointed? We know for sure. And when did an anointing occur? He was anointed for his burial, but he was also he was anointed. He was anointed so king of kings and lord of lords. So anointed for his burial and anointed king, and he came in riding on a donkey, and was literally crucified with what sign? Did it say he said he was king of the Jews on the sign? Uh-uh. It said. Daniel 2, 44 and 45. We're talking about kingdoms being forever. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. It shall stand forever. 
Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So what is that what is that saying? So after all the kingdoms becoming like even greater than the previous one, then Christ is gonna come in the middle of the last kingdom and just establish, lay down the law and be the, the only thing remaining and just be the most powerful and reign. I couldn't have said it better. Psalm 2, 6, and 7. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Son of God. The king. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Matthew 26, Christ, the Passover lamb, anointed king of kings, betrayed by all. Psalm 41.9 Is that going to happen? How does that happen? That's Judas. And who else abandoned and betrayed him? Everyone. Judas specifically, and then everyone. Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. And also in Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, reading through those, the sheep were scattered. seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages thirty pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. What is that? Well, Judas got thirty pieces and he even threw them in the house of the Lord when he realized. And then what do they use it for? They bought the potter's field and made it a burial place for strangers. And so, what is the term potter's field used for even today, everywhere? A burial place for strangers? Yeah, everywhere. I mean, New York's got one. They, people talk about it, reference everywhere you go, the potter's fields bought and used for um, burial of strangers, unknowns. Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man, my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. So they raised swords, right, to defend Jesus. And he said, put the sword away, heal. And they came with swords and clubs, and the sheep, what? So did that happen? And on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with the disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with twelve disciples. 
As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who betray, will betray me. The Son of Man is a go, just as it is written of him. Did we just see that? And the betrayal and everything? The son, just as it is written, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said to him, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. So later, when Judas betrays him in the garden, and Jesus um, you know, said he could call on a dozen, you know, twelve over 12 legions of angels. Um, keep, keep this in mind. This is uh, Titus coming in with uh, 60,000 troops. And um, then they said that was four legions back then. So he's given four legions of troops, about 60,000. So that would have been 15,000 in, in a legion. Uh, normally, uh, legions are thought to be between 4,200 to 6,000, depending on whether you're at war or not. Um, so we'll do the math when we get there. But keep that in mind, uh, that number 60,000. Uh, because five, if you had 5,000 in a legion, and the over 12 legions, that's over 60,000 angels, warriors of God. How many angels did it take to take out all the firstborn? In Egypt, one. And how about? Um, and how many angels did it take to take out the whole Assyrian army that was attacking Jerusalem? That was my next. Yeah, excellent. Right on cue. Perfect. So, what would twelve legions of angels do? So imagine Jesus sitting there having the Passover with them right as he's about to fulfill the scripture of the Passover and the Lord's Supper. In fact, uh, today, first of the, every, the, the first Sunday of the month, we um, institute the, the Lord's Supper, the Passover. Um, so maybe we could, um, we'll stop for a minute and prepare for that. And then um, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper at this time. All right. Thank you, Lord. Please name pray. Amen. So going to, if you want to participate in the Lord's Supper, um, there is scripture that we just read uh, earlier. There's penalties if you if you're sinning or if your heart's not ready or your mind's not set and you're not understanding the gravity or going for the Lord. There's penalties with that. So if you are a born-again believer and you're pursuing Christ and persevering in Christ and you're clean before the Lord, if not, just stop the video and get clean before the Lord and take that time to purify yourself. All right, Father God, um, just prepare our hearts and minds and souls as we think about the full gravity of you sitting down with your disciples as we literally read through this chapter and at this point, you're having the final Passover supper with the disciples as we're honoring that as you commanded us to, as you institute that. And here they are with the disciples. You picture Christ. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, thank you, Lord, for your being the Passover lamb in your body and what you've done for us, Lord, and given us an opportunity to be clean and do your will and be in heaven. Amen. And it was unleavened bread, like we talked about, um, to, to, for all those factors that we talked about. He broke it and gave it to the disciples. And said, take, eat, this is my body. And just think about his body and what he underwent for us.
And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, and we used the grape juice, thank you, Father God, for the blood that you poured out for us and the sacrifice that you made to atone for our sins and wash our robes white as snow as we persevere to you, with you to the end and receive you and repent of our sins. And being obedient um, to you in every way. Amen. He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Andrew, can you uh, read Psalm 118? Traditionally, um, it's been reported that may have been one of the psalms that they sang uh, before going out, and it's uh, re so relevant. Or even maybe previous songs before that. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me, surrounded on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. For the Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me, and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords upon the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. So many truths in that. Amen. Awesome. After singing him, again, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Thank you so much, Andrew. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. You guys remember reading that? But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Did he do that? Yeah, he went to Galilee. They were fishing. Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too. 
Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to him, My soul is deep in grief to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So what is that showing uh, regarding what Christ is going through? He's going through literally the experience of having to submit his will to God's will. So what what kind of trait is that representative of? Humility. Yeah, you, yeah, humility and being human. Like he's having a surrender. Yeah, he's humble. Absolutely accepting it. But he's having, humanly, he's saying, look, there's another. I mean, I have to endure this, I will. And he's showing us the example of God's will is best, but it doesn't mean, he's, He's not excited about it. He's not excited to go in there and conquer death. And it's, it's a terrible, suffering, awesome, in a difficult way, amount of suffering and strain that he's under and pressure, even to the point where his tears are blood. And for tears to be blood, capillaries have to pop from that level of mourning. You have to mourn so deeply Medically, uh, you literally form blood. He was under that much duress and stress. And so, talking about betrayal, remember? He dipped his hand with him, his own disciple, that, that deployed, that walked with him, held the money bag, was with him. His own disciples, all of them betrayed him. And Judas specifically woe to that man who sold him out for 30 shekels of silver. And Jesus knew and said, go ahead, do, you know, do what you've come to do. He knew it was fulfilling scripture, but woe to that man that does it, right? So then Jesus is at the point where he's in the garden and he's just praying at the most extreme stress somebody could, could possibly feel under the highest duress. Have you guys been under stress and duress? That, think about that stress that's just, it's over, you're out, uh, it's, it's, it feels like the end, it's as deep of stress and betrayal and pain and suffering and disrespect and just abuse um, is the max of that. It, he is God, he's in control and he knows all this, but he's, he's saying this to us, showing that he's not self, he's not going through it as a God removed. He's actual physically taking this on. That's the point. And in relating to what we stress we undergo, but also showing that he suffered tremendously for our sins and paid the full debt at the max degree possible as a sacrificial one. My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And Jesus came with him to a place called Gethsemane. He took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee to begin to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. How grieved was he? To you so grieved, he almost died from grief, from the stress of grief. The grief was so deep and so bad, it basically was the, is, is much grief and pain and grief. You could suffer right up to the point of death. Any one more ounce or drop of grief and he, and he, and he, he would die. I mean, capillaries popping death. That's what he took on. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father... If it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So what's he teaching us? Flesh is like, does not want to be 
maimed, mutilated, killed, right? Or destroyed or, or suffered. But he knows God's will is best. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, so you mean you can't keep, not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So they were all, every one of them said, I will not betray you even to the point of death. And he just needs them to keep watch. But what about, so what's that say about the flesh in terms of your guarding? What kind of level of guard do you need to have up? Max guard for the flesh. Max. Um, so you gotta you gotta focus on Christ, pray with him, be with him, fill fill with him. He's the only, he's the one that has the strength. So you have to empty yourself and fill with him and pursue him and be holy. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. So what's the solution? God's will. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. He left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. I mean, praying as fervently and deeply and, and just desperately needing backup, def, def, desperately needing an arm to lean on. So when you look around for a human arm and, and some camaraderie and binding, what, is, what support will you find strength in? Christ, just Christ. That's the only one you can lean on that has the support. The flesh will is weak. Now you what are you are you are you supposed to anticipate that you're gonna fail or do you strive for holiness and, and go to God's will? And and max that max it out. Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave him a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him immediately. Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out, drew out his sword, and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said, Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? At that time Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this takes place to fill the scripture of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So over 12 legions of angels. We talk about the power of one angel, a legion, uh, traditionally thought to be around 4,200 soldiers, 5,300 of the uh, elite um, from the wealthy would join them. Uh, Battle strong could be up to 6,000. Um, at the time, Titus took the city that a legion, four legions, they had 15,000 each, thought to be around 60,000 soldiers total. Maybe some others joined ranks with them to round that out. But, so we know there's, um, I mean, that's just calling down, you know, imagine 60,000 plus angels or however many a legion represented. I mean, what would that do? 60,000 human soldiers could take all of Jerusalem. 60,000 angels, greater than, I mean, one could wipe out a army of well over, between 100 and 200,000, you know. And all the stronghold, strongest 
nation in the world, Egyptian, all the firstborn in one night, you know, through all the guard and strength and demons they had, you know, they, they tried to enlist. So who was in charge? Christ was in charge of everything he did. He suffered maximally, was betrayed and abused maximally, betrayed by everyone, anointed as king. He was the Passover perfect lamb. And they came out with swords and robbers in the night. They were in the temple every day, right? Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were gathered together. This is at night, sneaking around at night. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and entered in, and sat down with the officers, officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole of the council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus, so they might put him to death. They did not find any. I think that's an important point, is there was, they had no ability to find anything false, no matter how much they tried to fabricate. I mean, even at their max wickedness and fabrication in the dark of night, they could not produce any evidence against them. They were unable to. They did not have the power to do that or the ability. Of course, they didn't have anything either. In addition to that, they couldn't even fabricate it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. They did not find any evidence. This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God to rebuild it in three days. Did that happen? The fact that they testified that against him is amazing. They were fully aware of that testimony that he would said he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. They were aware. So what a crime against them they're testifying on our behalf that Christ said that, and then he died and was resurrected in three days, and they're testifying that they were aware of that. Even So afterward, when it was fulfilled, they're testifying here and they were aware of that fact. So the fact they're aware of it, and then they testify trying to accuse Jesus, they testified so heavily against themselves, they just testified they were aware of that being a fact. I find that utterly amazing. And the fact it's recorded forever in Scripture, which is the Logos, which is Christ. The high priest stood up and said to him, you do not answer? Did that fulfill Scripture? We just read. He was silent. What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. The high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. That's ironic. That you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And by the living God, Christ answered him. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. you said it yourself. Right? You just said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, of power, coming and going on the clouds of heaven. And did that occur? That's fulfilling scripture, and it did occur. And it's going to occur. How amazing is that? Then the high priest tore his robes, and said, they do that when they're trying to protest greatly, grieve. He said he is blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you've now heard of the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. Another slapped him and said, prophesy to us, O Christ, who is the one who hits you? So what kind of abuse did he undergo? Just like scripture said, for our sins. Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard and a servant girl came to him and said, you too were with Jesus the Galilean, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. When he'd gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth, and he again denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you too were one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear. 
I do not know the man, and immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So here is Jesus being accused and being treated like a criminal in the dead of night, you know, being hauled off. And everyone betrayed him, fleed. Even one man lost his clothes in the process. They all scattered. Remember? And there he is at the, by the campfire, and he's denying uh, before Christ. And then the rooster crows. There he is before the high priest Caiaphas. Christ, the Passover lamb, anointed king of kings, betrayed by all. You want to pray, Mom? Oh, Father God, just what you went through for us and for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord, we just thank you so much for that. Just help us to remember that every day, Lord, and just in the garden, Lord, basically sweating out blood, just to have that human feeling, but to be God also and to know what was about to happen and humanly feel that also, Lord, just, um, just help that to sink into our hearts and just to really realize that, Lord, and to live our life for you, God, and just you did that for us, so what small things can we do every day for you? What bigger things can we do, Lord? Just everything we do, we do it for you. Thank you for today's sermon. Thank you for your word. Be with us as we go throughout our week and every step in what you have planned for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome back to our praise and worship. We're here with Rachel Duncan. Go for Christ, Hebrews 412 Ministries. We take the living, breathing word of God. And put it to scripture. This is a song I put on our heart about, I should say, Kijon Valley based on Matthew 26. Yes, this is Kijon Valley based on Matthew 26, 36 through 56. Taking in the cold heart 
to the high priest. 